Hello everyone and welcome to an episode of Dr. Sonny's Super Happy Fun Anatomy Channel. If you like this channel, be sure to click subscribe below and leave a comment over here. There's gonna be hot links up on this corner, so check them out. Let's get started. I would also like to say that I now have a sponsor for my channel. I would like to thank the makers of Escitalopram for all of their funding for my amazing, super happy, fun channel. Okay, anyway, let's get started. <clears throat> so, welcome everybody to uh, the DPT uh, Anatomy uh, online class. This is going to be different from uh, most uh, things we've done uh, before because, of course, we have to do this online. So my uh, conception for this class is going to be, I still got some confetti on me, still going to be, uh, it's, it, it's going to be that um, I'm going to provide these short lectures in bite-sized segments. Uh, I'm going to provide all of the PowerPoints um, that I use during this semester uh, for you online. Uh, so it's going to be your responsibility to review the PowerPoints and to watch these lectures. And then during the week, during regular class time, I'm planning on having uh, open office hours via Zoom or Skype or, or whatever the case may be right now, I'm planning on using Zoom most of the time. So uh, within the Canvas course, I'm going to uh, create an announcement that has a link to what's going to be my Zoom open office hours. And so during class time, probably Thursday mornings, uh, I will log into Zoom and I expect uh, that uh, most of you will attend those Zoom office hours where you'll be able to ask me questions about the lecture, questions about the PowerPoints. Then Thursday afternoon at one o'clock, I'm going to have a weekly quiz on Canvas that will open up at one o'clock for about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so everybody in the class will have to log in to uh, Canvas at 1 o'clock. They have 15 minutes to take weekly quizzes. I think there will be about 10 questions per quiz. So you'll have plenty of time to do them, um, but you won't have extra time. You won't just be able to do it whenever you feel like it. Uh, so in that way, I'm hoping that all of this combined will kind of uh, be similar to uh, what we normally have for class. It also means that I'll be able to keep track of your progress via the, um, the open office hours and via the quizzes. Uh, so this video right now, I'm going to cover the uh, syllabus and the expectations for the class, uh, and then we'll move on from there. So again, this is PHT 6115. Uh, it's, uh, so within this course during the summer, we have mainly the DPT students. Uh, we also have uh, some graduate uh, anatomy certificate students who are taking this course in order to um, gain more anatomical understanding and, and get enough credit hours in anatomy to become accredited instructors uh, in an anatomical sciences program. And we also have some kinesiology students uh, who are graduate students uh, in the kinesiology program and who are taking this course along with their other kinesiology courses. So welcome to all of you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very open to being contacted any way you need to contact me. Um, so my email, you, uh, you'll be able to contact me by email, james.sawney at ucf.edu. My office telephone number is forwarding to my cell phone right now, so you can call me at 407-823-4026, and that will ring my cell phone. Uh, so if you feel like you need to talk about uh, anything at all, whatever, whatever's standing in the way of you succeeding in the class, you can feel free to give me a ring. And then I'll have webcam, face-to-face uh, -face office hours, like I said, via Zoom on a regular basis. Uh, so let's go through this first set of slides. First, I always like to, you know, tell you a little bit about myself so you understand who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, so 
Uh, my wife and I really love to travel. It's one of the things we enjoy doing most. And so here I've, I'm showing you some pictures of my family uh, as we're traveling. So here are some pictures of us uh, ready to board the uh, airplane in Laos to head to Cambodia. And here, um, my wife and son traveling by tuk-tuk in Laos. Uh, here I am uh, with my son Jeremy in front of a section of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and so um, my son also, so we've lived all over the world. Uh, we lived in Korea for about a year. And here my son is celebrating his first birthday in Korea in traditional Korean fashion, wearing the traditional Korean uh, first birthday celebration clothing. And on the first birthday in Korea, it's particularly celebrated because uh, it's a big milestone that means the uh, child has made it past many of the problems that might, um, that might uh, arise in the first year that, that might, uh, you know, uh, cause uh, the child to die or become sick or, or uh, in other, uh, you know, other problems. So they celebrate in quite a large way. And one of the things they do on the first birthday in Korea is they set a table in front of the child and put many different objects in front of the child. And the first object that the child picks up is, is supposed to traditionally indicate the child's um, future career and what their life is going to be like. So my child, uh, Jeremy, he picked up the paintbrush, the artisan's paintbrush, which means he's going to be a scholar. And at the same time, he picked up a microphone, which means uh, I figure that he's going to be a famous scholar, uh, much like myself now that I'm on these uh, weekly broadcasts, or uh, perhaps Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, so uh, anyway, here we are celebrating his first birthday in Korea. He's now six years old. Uh, so the reason that we've gotten to travel so much is because uh, I spent about three years in the Army. I felt that it was uh, an important way for me to give back uh, because I've been so fortunate in my life. And um, growing up hearing stories about my uh, grandfather's time in World War II inspired me. And so after I got my PhD, I volunteered for the Army. Uh, and so within the three years that my wife and I were in the Army, that I was in the Army, my, uh, my wife and I uh, traveled, we, we moved about six times, traveled all over the world, uh, got to see some very interesting things. And so um, I don't recommend it just for the travel, but uh, it was quite the experience. So more pictures of my time in the military. And then uh, here we are, uh, our family together. Uh, we also enjoy hiking and camping. So some pictures of us hiking and camping together here. So I really enjoy uh, giving you quotes as well. Quotes, I think, can be very inspiring. Um, they can also be something that we can take with us and share with other people. Uh, most of us listening to this uh, lecture are going to become clinicians, work with patients, work with uh, research subjects, or maybe teach uh, other health professionals at some point. And quotes are something that you can, if they inspire you, you can memorize them, keep them with you, and share them uh, as the time is needed. So I'll share this quote with you during this first lecture, and perhaps throughout the rest of the lectures, uh, we'll uh, see some more interesting quotes uh, that might inspire you or speak to you in some way. So here, this quote is from uh, the book Siddhartha, which is a book about a young man who, uh, who travels around the world seeking enlightenment. Uh, so he's uh, working within the, the Buddhist tradition and so at some point during his travels, uh, he comes to a realization and says this, It is this what you mean, isn't it? That the river is everywhere at once, at the source and at the mouth, at the waterfall, at the ferry, at the rapids, in the sea, in the mountains, everywhere at once. 
and that there is only the present time for it, not the shadow of the past, not the shadow of the future. And when I had learned that, I looked at my life and it was also a river. So I think this quote's important, especially during our first lecture, because it speaks to the nature of the journey that you all are taking together. And so on this journey, uh, sometimes we become anxious about the future or regretful about the past. Um, we worry about things that are going to happen and about the things that we can and can't control. And I think it's important to embrace the journey, embrace the experience, and realize that there's a process involved in all of this, that you can't just uh, move instantly from the springs to the sea, that you can't choose where you are on your journey, but you can choose how you react to the place you're in at that time. I also think it, it's important in another way, in that it, it talks about how we interact with each other on our journey. So we are the river, and at some point, uh, tributaries will join us. Other people's journeys will intersect our own. And the waters of other people's journeys will mix with ours, uh, and their journey will influence our journey for the rest of our existence. And so I think it's important for you to realize that I am here with you on your journey, and I will always uh, do whatever I can to help you succeed. You're the one that's going to have to uh, put in the effort and put in the work and succeed on your own, but I'm a resource for you, and I will always be in your corner uh, from this point on to make sure that you succeed in the ways that you want to succeed. It's just a matter of you putting in that effort. So let's start talking about the syllabus. So the syllabus should be on Canvas. There is a syllabus acknowledgement assignment which all of you have to complete. It's part of the university, the state requirements, in fact. So be sure to go on to the Canvas course under assignments and just type in that uh, whatever you can copy and paste, whatever it says, I have read and acknowledged the syllabus and just click submit. It's a zero point assignment, but it records your activity in the course uh, for the point, for the sake of uh, things like, um, uh, what's it called, financial aid and, and scholarships and stuff like that. <clears throat> so go into Canvas and do that. All of the course material that I'm providing you, I intend to provide it to you, uh, except for the quizzes. Uh, the quizzes will be in Canvas, but all the rest of the course material is going to be located on my Google Drive. And you can access that Google Drive right here, tinyurl.com slash sonnyanatomy. And that Google Drive will have, um, <clears throat> it will have all of my PowerPoints that will be needed for the course. And I'm intending to put on these videos into the Google Drive as well. I do this for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's just easier for me to control it instead of putting it on Canvas. And also because anything I put on Canvas becomes university copyright. And so um, I'm avoiding that uh, because I don't think they should own my lectures. Uh, so at any rate, all the material, uh, log in. Uh, it should just be open to anybody. Any computer uh, can access tinyurl.com slash sonnyanatomy. You can find all the material there. <clears throat> so here's my contact information for the course. Uh, of course, uh, so I am uh, James Sonny. I pronounce my last name Sonny, like Johnny. Um, uh, kind of a, a weird last name, but uh, anyway, that's how you pronounce it. My office, in case we ever happen to get back in person to in-person courses uh, this semester, is in the HPA1 building, room 270. But my email address is here, james.sonny at ucf.edu. And my office phone number is there. Again, my office phone number will forward to my cell phone. I don't think you can text uh, that phone number, but you can give it a call. You can email me. Um, my emails ring on my phone or, you know, they chime on my phone instantly. So if I have my phone anywhere near me, I tend to respond to emails very quickly. I'm very responsive to emails. Uh, and then I'll, I'll put an announcement for the Zoom uh, link. So back when we were in person, I had an open door policy. If I was in my office, 
Uh, even if my door was closed, I was happy to have you knock uh, and I'd answer the door because um, sometimes the hallway just gets noisy. But uh, now that we're online, I can't, I don't have a door to open to you. So you just have to email and this is going to be a different experience and we're all going to have to, um, you know, work to make it succeed and see how it goes. <clears throat> so the important textbooks, uh, there are several in the syllabus that you'll need to own. Um, the two top ones for this semester, well, the top one for this, for, you know, for the rest of your life is going to be an anatomy atlas. And I highly recommend Gilroy's Atlas of Anatomy, which is published by Thema. Uh, it's the atlas that I use. It is extremely extensive. Uh, it has great figures for all of the muscles, all the nerves. It also has kind of vectored images of the muscle movements. So you can see where the muscles attach and it makes it very easy to figure out, um, you know, how, why the muscles move joints in certain ways. So this is basically your Bible for the rest of your life because you're always gonna be able to refer back to it. Uh, you'll have that, that uh, textbook on your shelf forever for your next 50 years. Um, in addition to Gilroy's, there are some important textbooks from which I draw material. Uh, most of the images I have in my PowerPoints are taken from these textbooks, so I try to give you as much as I can in my PowerPoints, but if it's not enough, you need to go to the textbooks to find the additional images to make things make sense. Uh, so these additional textbooks uh, are like um, Haynes Neuroanatomy is important for the neuro lectures that I'm going to be giving you. Um, Nolte's Neuroanatomy is a broader, more, uh, it includes more physiology and stuff. It's not pure anatomy. Uh, so if you need to go more in depth to learn the function of things, uh, then uh, Nolte's uh, Neuroanatomy textbook is going to be a great one. And these are listed in the syllabus as well. For the laboratory dissection, uh, so this semester, I'm planning on this course being all online, all lecture only. Uh, next semester in the fall, I'm planning on doing all laboratory dissection, no lectures, just straight laboratory dissection. For laboratory dissection, you will need my textbook, The Photographic Dissector, for students of physical therapy. And so the ISBN is listed in the syllabus for that. And that is a step-by-step -step dissector, and it includes uh, photographs at every stage of dissection. So it will walk you through the dissection uh, as if I were standing next to you telling you what to do. And in fact, in laboratory, we'll have uh, numerous faculty, TAs, uh, assisting you throughout the, uh, the fall semester. Uh, so um, we're going to uh, you know, walk you through in addition to the textbook. Uh, but that that textbook is designed around this course. It's designed for this course. So I highly recommend that you pick that up uh, as soon as you can because it also has clinical correlates in it, which are going to be relevant this semester. It also has um, licensing exam style anatomy questions, which I have produced. And those exam questions uh, are going to give you a good idea about what my exams are like during this semester. So the grading for the course is very easy, very simple. There are going to be four exams. So every uh, third week is going to be another exam, which is worth 100 points. So there are 400 points in the course total. And so it's just total number of points out of 400 points uh, is your grade. And the grading scale is down here. Uh, it's also in the syllabus. It's a little bit different from your other DPT courses if you're in the DPT program, which most of you are, uh, in that I consider a 70% in my course to be a solid grade. So a B minus is a 70%. If you get a 70.0%, you will end up with a B minus in my anatomy course. And that's different than the grading scale uh, from other DPT courses. Uh, the weekly quizzes, uh, which I told you will be open at 1 o'clock on Thursdays, 
Those weekly quizzes are optional. They're not part of your final grade. You do not have to take them. Uh, I encourage you to take them because what I do with those uh, quiz grades is if your cumulative quiz grades are higher than your lowest exam score in the course, then those cumulative uh, quiz grade will replace that lowest exam score in the course. Uh, so the quizzes are a good way to help me keep track of how everyone in the class is doing. So for that reason, I encourage you because I might need to modify the speed at which this course goes or what things I emphasize um, during open office hours uh, to account for those sorts of problems. But it's also good for you to take because it can boost your grade. In fact, about 70% traditionally of the course improves their score based on the quiz grades. Uh, so that's, that's an important source uh, of points uh, for, for this course. <clears throat> so I think something that you need to hear about right away, uh, which some of you may not have heard before, is about how to maximize your studying. Uh, so there's different approaches to learning course material. And you probably never heard of these different strategies or different ways of thinking, but I think they play a critical role in making your studying more efficient. So in graduate school, you're going to be receiving so much information at one time that it's going to be very difficult to absorb that information. For this reason, it's important that you understand how you best learn information. What are techniques you use? Uh, are you a visual learner, auditory, those sorts of things uh, that will help you understand how you can maximize your learning. So there's different approaches to learning in, in coursework. Uh, students uh, can be surface learners, they can be strategic learners, and they can be deep learners. So a strategic learner is somebody that learns specifically to meet the course requirements. Uh, so the, a surface learner uh, tends to memorize things. They'll use flashcards, tables, uh, those sorts of things to remember disparate pieces of information. But it's very difficult for a surface learner to apply that information in a given scenario. A strategic learner is somebody that learns to achieve the highest possible score in the course based on the requirements. So this person is going to focus on the information that they perceive to be most important based on the lectures and the PowerPoints that we give you. So this person might be able to get a good score in the course, um, might be able to excel academically, but when it comes to applying that information, again, a surface learner may not um, be able to use the information that they've learned because they are just taking the important pieces and trying to remember those to game the course, basically. A deep learner is the type of learner in graduate school that we want to encourage. A deep learner learns to understand and seek the connections between the pieces of information they get. Uh, so a deep learner may end up with a B in the course, but I can meet them in the hall and talk about in-depth neural circuitry or developmental embryology uh, in a really um, you know, intelligent and, and comprehensive way, whereas I might not be able to do that with a strategic or a superficial learner. And so you all that are taking this course are entering careers where you're going to have to use and apply this information. You're going to be working with patients or with research subjects or other students where you need to uh, understand and talk about and discuss this information. So personally, uh, on a personal level, I don't care what your grade is. In fact, I never look at my grade book other than to insert the grades. When I'm grading my paper, the, the exams and whatnot, those, I, I don't even look at the names on the, on the answer sheets. I don't um, really pay attention to who's scoring what in my course. What I pay attention to is when I'm in laboratory with somebody, can I talk with them about this material? Uh, do they understand the concepts? 
And it's those concepts that you need to retain and bring with you to every subsequent course that you're going to take in your respective programs. So this isn't like, a, this isn't lump and dump. This isn't undergrad courses where you could study the night before. <clears throat> we are preparing you to uh, use this information on a daily basis. Uh, so in your careers, you will be using this information constantly. And so it's not, the courses are not cumulative, but the nature of the information requires cumulative and comprehensive understanding. So I encourage you all to start out the course with the goal of being a deep learner who uh, learns the connections between the material, learns to make large uh, abstract uh, categorizations and to apply information in specific ways. Um, because that's what the exams are gonna be like. I'm not going to ask you simple questions like, is this a ball and socket joint? Or what's the name of this muscle? I'm gonna ask you questions based on um, clinical vignettes and patient uh, histories, and you're gonna to have to determine what muscle has a deficit or what nerves might be impaired. So we are preparing you to form that diagnostic type of thinking that you haven't been trained in potentially in the past. So <clears throat> now that we've uh, thought about the strategies, the approaches that we can use to learn the information, let's talk about the specific ways in which we learn the, uh, and memorize information. So there are different types of learners out there. I think most of us rely um, to a large extent on our visual understanding. We see a picture in a textbook and we um, memorize that picture. We see, uh, you know, we hear about an abstract idea and we try to create a picture in our head about it. So that's visual learning. There's also auditory learners, people who learn by listening to somebody talk about something. Or people who learn by hearing themselves recite information. So those are auditory learners. There are also physical learners. Uh, physical learners like to get their hands on something. They like to move a model. They like to <clears throat> feel the attachments. Uh, so physical learners are very good in the laboratory component. Unfortunately, laboratory isn't until fall in this cycle, uh, but you can still uh, do things as a physical learner outside of the laboratory to uh, you know, to help you understand information. You can create models. You can buy some clay and mold shapes uh, to, to create muscles or to um, do things like that. You can, you know, color uh, images, print out black and white anatomical images and color those because that physical interaction with the image is going to help you imprint that information on your mind. There are other types of learners, verbal learners. Again, that's a, that's a subset of the auditory learner type. So verbal learners like to talk about the information. Um, and I encourage all of you to try this. So some of these techniques might be outside your comfort zone, but verbal learning, especially in the careers you're pursuing, is going to be an important way to cement the information because at some point, you are gonna to have to talk about this information with a patient or another student or a, a participant in a trial, a study, a research study. And so you're going to have to be comfortable conveying this information verbally. Uh, so I always tell my students that they are in this class because they have chosen to become experts in this information. Uh, to, so in order to learn the information, you have to prepare as if you are the expert and you have to present the information to somebody else. Take my PowerPoint slides, take my lectures, and stand in front of a mirror or pace around your, your apartment and talk about the slides as if you are giving the lecture to an audience. That way you'll be able to tell what information you're deficient in and what information you need to study and focus on more, you'll also understand what information you have down and you don't have to revisit time and time again. So that's a very efficient way 
to learn uh, what you need to work on is doing this verbal process. So some learners are also solitary learners. Some learners are social. Um, I'll tell you right now that usually solitary learning is not as efficient because you're not testing yourself. You're not being challenged about the information. Solitary learners tend to sit with a textbook open and stare at a picture. And that picture that they're staring at becomes familiar to them. And they, they mistake familiarity with knowledge. And so if, if you have to be a solitary learner because of the circumstances, go ahead, stare at that picture. But at some point, maybe five minutes in, 10 minutes in, close that textbook, put it aside, get out a blank sheet of paper and try to draw the image. That will challenge you to, um, to learn what you are missing, what you don't know as well as you thought. So under the circumstances, again, solitary learning may be necessary, but I encourage you uh, to interact and to partake in social learning because that will challenge you about concepts that you don't even know might be important. So get with your classmates, connect via Canvas, share uh, email addresses and whatnot, and form your own Zoom study groups. Uh, if you, those of you who might, uh, you know, uh, share an apartment uh, have an advantage because uh, you can work together uh, on the information and really maximize that social learning. But it's important to go outside your defined bubbles as well because other people might find that other information was important and you might have missed that information. So this is an important aspect and it's going to be harder during this semester than it normally is because the social aspect is missing. So you're going to have to put in the extra effort there. Um, here at the end, I have logical learners who have to put things in a logical sequence, and, and that's good for um, coming up with those comprehensive understandings about the uh, information and how it connects. And then active versus passive. So all of the examples I've given are examples of active learning. You don't want to be the individual who sits there staring at a textbook uh, for you know minutes, hours at a time, because that's not active. That's not cementing the information in your mind. So the next question I always get asked uh, early in the semester is, what do we need to know? There's so much information, Dr. Sani. What is it that's important? And my answer is always everything. You need to know everything. Everything is important. Um, so you need to know every bump and groove on every bone, every attachment point of every muscle, every movement that every muscle makes. Um, you need to understand the innervations of the muscles and the irrigation of those muscles, the blood supply, what provides uh, oxygenated blood and, and which vessel drains the muscle or the structure. You need to understand the nerve routes, how they branch, where they're traveling, where they're coming from, what they're going to. Uh, and you need to understand many of these clinical correlates that I'm going to give you because they provide that uh, diagnostic um, thinking that you need to cultivate. Uh, so that diagnostic reasoning skill is going to be critical. One of the um, key ways to study this mass amount of information is to create correlations in your mind. For every object, for every structure that you look at, every nerve, uh, challenge yourself to know three things about it. For instance, for a nerve, where is it coming from? Where is it located? Where do I find it? And where is it going? What's it innervating? Those sorts of things. For every muscle, what's its action? What's its attachments? Um, where do I find it? What joint does it cross? What joint does it move? Uh, so by studying these correlative pieces of information, you can challenge yourself uh, to um, connect all of the structures so they're not just random pieces of information in your mind. And everything you learn is going to reinforce itself instead of being more confusing. So I encourage you to do that. A good way to study the, uh, in this way is to challenge each other. Okay, um, here's a muscle. What's its name? 
Uh, and then the other person names it and challenge the other person, what's an attachment of this muscle? And you go back and forth challenging each other until you get to an entirely different area of the body, traveling along nerves and muscle attachments and bones and joints and those sorts of things. So in that way, you can connect this information in your mind uh, in ways that you're not going to be able to if you just use flashcards, if you just use tables. Flashcards and tables have their place uh, to get you that fundamental uh, base, which you should have gotten in undergraduate, but now we're building on that from here on out. <clears throat> and then the course schedule. Uh, so um, for, again, for this semester, it's going to be 100% lecture. Uh, through the entire summer semester. There's going to be uh, four examinations, which are worth 100 points each, and those will fall on the Thursday afternoons uh, on each third week. So in week one, we're studying osteology. Uh, we're going to study the back and the spinal cord some, and a little bit about the development of the nervous system. In week two, we'll move to the shoulder, the axillary region, which is the armpit. Uh, and we'll talk more about the brachial plexus and how the spinal cord contributes to the upper limb movements. In week three, uh, you'll be responsible for the arm, the forearm, and the hand. And then on Thursday of that third week at one o'clock, the exam will open. Uh, it will probably be between 60 and 70 questions. Uh, and um, that will be the first quarter of the summer semester, those first three weeks. And then that will repeat, uh, you know, with different uh, structures, different emphases throughout the semester. So the first half of the summer will be um, pretty much all musculoskeletal, muscles and bones, attachments, innervations. The second half, we're going to go visceral. We're going to talk about the brain to a large extent. We're going to talk about the abdominal viscera, uh, the thorax, the pelvis, and the perineum, that sort of stuff. So that's the basic outline for this course. Uh, and uh, I think I'll go ahead and end this video here. My plan is to make these videos a little bit more bite-sized when we get into the actual lectures so that you can focus on um, you know, individual topics. In my lectures, I am not going to... Um, I'm, I'm not going to just sit in front of the camera and reiterate muscles and tables of attachments and stuff. I'm just going to give you clinical correlates, important stuff that might not make sense otherwise, and it's gonna be your responsibility to memorize that other information. So real quickly before I end, I will show you the uh, tinyurl.com uh, Sony Anatomy uh, uh, Google Drive. So I have split this up into two different folders, A for the musculoskeletal, which is the first six weeks, and B for the visceral. So you go into A for musculoskeletal, and it'll show you PDFs of every um, PowerPoint slide I am going to be using. So they're labeled 1-1, 1-2. Um, so for the first week, uh, we'll be covering 1-1 through... Um, 2-3 and I'll make announcements on Canvas about on the course uh, to uh, give you information about what PowerPoints you are going to be responsible for for the quizzes and exams so it's very clear and again uh, I'm very responsive very open to emails uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not making office hours requirement uh, a requirement but um, I found that the students that visit my office most frequently tend to be the ones who improve their performance uh, over the semester and who really excel. Uh, and so I encourage you, even if you just pop in and listen in with your camera and microphone shut off, I encourage you all uh, to use the assigned time uh, to interact with me in whatever ways you need to even if it's just sitting back and listening to other students' questions. Uh, so anyway, I'll end the video, and uh, I hope to uh, see you in office hours.